In today's video, we'll go through how my first Steam game went from here to here. I'll walk you through the first prototype, the core ideas, development of visuals, music and sound effects, the code base, how each level and interface was built from the ground up, playtesting, and finally its launch to a broader audience and its presentation in the games fair. That being said, let's start. The Prototype In 2013, I started learning Unity in my spare time by going through several official and unofficial tutorials. One of those was about creating a wire chain through physics, to which I added a simple platform and a sphere. I made it so that when the arrow keys were pressed, the sphere was torqued. And when pressing the spacebar, a vertical force was added to the sphere, which caused it to jump. I was in complete awe how natural Unity's physics felt, and how quickly it was to create a rough working scene by putting together some basic components. So, an idea started to bubble up. What if you had to stay as long as possible on top of a platform, which would be riddled with several increasingly powerful antagonists that would directly or indirectly push you off the platform? And, starting from this idea, more elements were added, such as interactive platform blocks, destroyable floor tiles, backdrops, user interfaces, and some basic sound effects. Two releases resulted from this. The first one for Android mobile devices only, and afterwards another version was released with a new versus mode for the OUYA, Android TV, and Congregate. For this prototype, only one level was available. Reboot. I went to work on other projects after the prototype's launch, but the player's feedback kept looping through my mind. Several ideas eventually piled up into a new, improved version of the game, which I started to develop four years after the first prototype. First at night after work, then full time until completion. Laying out the solid base was essential in the beginning of the project, especially concept wise. Pre production, if you will. Surviving on top of a platform was the root idea, but was there latitude for other ideas? What about a multiplayer mode? Should it be versus or cooperative? Online or local only? Should it have power ups? Which player movements would be available? Only directional and jumps? Should it have a progressive difficulty, or would the player need to choose a difficulty level? How many levels should it have? What about the player's motivation to play these levels? What about the visual style? The audio? The code architecture? All of those aspects were essential to get right, as soon as possible. Root ideas and game modes. The game's core idea was about surviving on top of a platform, but should the game be objective-based or survival-based? Survival seems to be the best fit, but then a question came up. Survive what? Survival against other players would require a multiplayer versus mode, and an artificial intelligence to be played solo. On the other hand, survival against the world would naturally accommodate a single-player and cooperative mode. Having a focus on cooperation was enticing, because it would allow for more inclusion and give the opportunity to strike a balance between experienced and less experienced players, which would allow to translate to less frustration caused by huge proficiency gaps. Allowing for a local multiplayer mode would be something desirable as well, since I had this personal bias towards the games that physically joined the group of friends at the same place. Also, online multiplayer was set aside because of the added complexity and I try to keep the game as simple as possible, since I'd rather have a finished product than have an overly ambitious and finished project. So, because of all of these points, solo and local cooperation would be the modes available for this game. Difficulty. Again, having in mind that less is more, a progressive difficulty was strived for, as opposed to a bucket-based approach which forces the players to choose if the game would be easy, normal or hard. Choosing a difficulty level forces the player to commit to it and to accept that decision, placing the responsibility upon them. And it often happens to me when I choose a difficulty level like easy or normal that I keep wondering if I'm really good at the game or am I just being thrown softballs. <laughs> 
Progressive difficulty solves that problem right off the bat, but it shifts that burden from the player onto the developer's shoulders instead, who needs to craft an experience in which all difficulty ranges are covered. So progression would be twofold. Each level would start in an accessible way, but would gradually be more difficult as time would go on, and each level would be more challenging than the previous one throughout the campaign. Control and movement. To survive against the world, you'd need offensive maneuvers to protect yourself and to have the agency to keep you away from dangers. So two new movements were added to the already existing jump and double jump, the dash and the stomp. Dash could be used for mid-air control as an offensive maneuver or to interact with the world's objects. And taking inspiration from Super Mario 64, the stomp maneuver was added to allow mid-air plunges for precise vertical landings. With this set of movements, the player would be able to gain full control of the ball, easy to learn but hard to master. Additionally, it suppressed the need to have the power to control the ball mid-air just by pressing directional buttons, which would be less physically accurate and could smother the fun out of mastering the mechanics of the game. Power-ups Power-ups were not used, and this is why. First, they would add game design complexity, because every new power-up would increase the realm of possible scenarios during a game session, which increased the difficulty to strike a good game balance. Second reason was simplicity. Simplicity was held at high value during development, and power-ups would probably require the usage of a new button to trigger the power, more UI elements, and new concepts for the player to grasp. And again, less is more. Third was to focus on skill-based gameplay, instead of having power-ups attributed by chance, which could influence the player's perception that the level was not completed by their own merit. Number four, they could be used as crutches. Power-ups are outstanding when used properly, like in roll cage or grip, but they can also be abused to cover up design flaws. Having a no power-up limitation forced me to think in alternative ways to make the game more interesting, and it was a challenge that I was drawn to. Visual Aesthetics Defining the game's visual appearance early on was quite important, since it would influence the reasoning behind 3D models, textures, UIs, colors, mood, and even audio. And the two most influential references that I had were Google Material Design and Lara Croft Go. Coming from an Android development background, I was fairly exposed to material design which is a visual language that synthesizes the classic principles of good design. These principles go beyond mobile and web UI development and span through a swath of different form factors and use cases. I personally found it quite beautiful and applied its principles throughout the game's aesthetics, both in the UI, but also in the overall style of the game. This influenced the game to have a simple, clean and coherent style. And Lara Croft Go is a beautiful game. The charming colors and elegant yet simple style made quite an impression on me. So, while building the game's visuals, I've consulted several screenshots of Lara Croft Go and attempted to transpose the design elements that I liked the most into survival ball. Codebase The prototype was a literal extension of the initial wire chain and ball physics experiment that I mentioned from before, and features were being added as I was learning Unity. This, added to rapid prototyping and little to no code architecture and planning, resulted in a code base that was entangled, difficult to follow, and hard to extend. The mythical spaghetti code base. The new version, on the other hand, was built from scratch, so several architectures were explored for the beginning of the project until one was found to fit the game best. The chosen approach followed these principles. First, each level would have a single entry point, the game controller which orchestrated the different actors. Second, the game controller contained all top-level parameters. So parameterization was facilitated by scriptable objects. For example, the player controller would have player parameters as a scriptable object exposed on the game controller. The player parameters could in turn have sub-parameters when needed. Third, dynamic objects such as the player, enemies, and interactable level parts would be created programmatically when possible. Number four, the base scene for each level should only have static or decorative objects. Number five, the object behavior should be managed by its specific controller. Game object components should be presentational and have as little behavior as possible. 
For example, a rocket thruster could have a component which changed the color and size of smoke and fire, but it would be the thruster's controller responsibility to drive the input value for this component. And finally, the orchestration of events from dynamic objects, user interaction and other data streams would be handled by a reactive approach, facilitated by UniRx. Levels The level creation process went somewhere along these lines. I would go for a long walk, without any audiobooks or entertainment, and pretty much just allow my mind to wander around. If an idea came up, I would write it down in a Google Keep note. At a later time, in a quiet place, I would dissect these ideas on paper to materialize the pros and cons, while further developing the ideas that seemed the most promising. First Sandbox Before building any of the levels, I built a scrappy sandbox level to work out the broader strokes of a player's movement. In this sandbox, the basic directional movements, jumps, stomps and dashes, which were immediate single charges at the time, were first developed and loosely tweaked. Rocket X SpaceX was landing their first rockets on drone ships when this first level was developed. It revolved around the concept of a four-thruster rocket platform, where each of the thrusters could be activated or deactivated by their adjacent button. An additional center button enabled or disabled all of the thrusters, and the platform's rockets required fuel, which could be replenished by shoving fuel crates, enemies, or even players in the center fuel intake. This level would set the tone for the upcoming ones, so it was important to pin down the core gameplay, level structure and enemy dynamics before moving to the next level. Just like changing a cosmological parameter would drastically change everything in the universe, like the possibility of life, the game's basilar parameters were set as tightly as possible early on, because even a small change could break all levels. For example, a small change in how players were, how high could they jump, and how gravity affects them, could translate into several hours of extra work to readjust every level, or could even render them completely obsolete. For these reasons, it took me around 355 hours to develop the bulk of Rocket X, about one-fifth of the project's time span. And as a side note, I found it important to track the time spent, so that I could keep myself accountable, and I'll give more details on this later. Garfunkel The original concept of the second level was a variation of the Simon game, and Garfunkel. The idea was that the sequence of lights would be played out first, and the players would need to have to mimic that sequence by orderly hitting the respective target pieces, at the cost of the highlighted pieces falling off if they were hit outside the sequence. There would exist as many platforms as the number of players. A quick level layout was built, and soon after the first place it became apparent the concept was flawed. Mimicking a sequence would mean that during the first phase, while the model sequence is being played out, the player would be left with nothing to do movement-wise. Moreover, after the second or third prompt of the sequence, the player would most likely forget which came next, because their main focus would be getting the ball movement right instead of focusing on the sequence. A realization came to me at this point. Simon is about memory, survival ball is about motor skills. Pivoting from this, came the idea of collapsing the two phases into a single phase, so no memorization was needed. The platform piece highlights would be immediate, and coupled with the background music rhythm, which would progressively get faster as time passed. The player would also have a limited time to hit these prompts, as prompted pieces would fall after each music measure if not hit on time. There was only one platform, since having multiple platforms would elicit a natural exploit, and this is because the player could quickly notice that the best strategy would be to focus all of their energy into a single platform, since there was not an intrinsic gain to be had by saving all platforms. One platform would suffice, and it would be easier for the player to manage. The music engine was one of the first tackled elements, and the easiest approach was to programmatically play the background music by sequentially playing short audio samples and the overall music rhythm would be dictated by the frequency to which they were played. Drum samples worked great for this case. But after a few playthroughs with these basic systems in place, something didn't feel quite right. The drum samples suggested a tribal feel, but they did not match the background appropriately, so four background experiments were made.
The last backdrop experiment was a simple water floor, which focused the player's attention in the platform and had the additional benefit of having a near plane where the player's shadow could be casted. The player's vertical shadow was a very important reference for the player's position, as I have learned. But even after these experiments, something was still off. Progressively, I realized that the real problem was related to the platform's shape. In a circular platform, the best strategy is to safeguard the inner pieces, since they are easily reachable and have an inferior angular speed when compared to the outer ones. Falling prey to sunk cost fallacy, I made some attempts to save this concept, such as rotating the inner pieces at higher speed, or rotating them at different axes, implementing piece decay, which released the piece when the player stayed on top of it for too long, and none of them worked, since these obstacles could be easily bypassed. Because of this, the level had to be scrapped altogether, since it was not acceptable in its current form. But the waterfall backdrop was later reused by Unfairfair, which I'll cover in a few minutes, and two new levels were forked from Garfunkel's base elements, Bitmill and Big Giant Head. Bitmill. Bitmill addressed one of the major issues in Garfunkel, which was the exploit of the circular platform shape. The solution was to have several loose square pieces, which were part of a cross or lengthwise treadmill. Randomly moving each piece along these two directions meant that no piece was permanently in the same area, like the central area. Every single piece was important to treasure and to save. The treadmill system was developed from scratch, and Garfunkel's music engine and the water floor backdrop were reused. After developing the level's basic game elements and validating their gameplay through playtesting, something that I'll cover afterwards, the DK concept was recycled from Garfunkel. Also, a special black button was placed in one of the platform pieces. If pressed, it decayed the adjacent pieces, and if a decayed piece was touched, it would fall. This concept apparently worked well, but when playtested with a group of friends, it was pointed out as being too punishing. When the special black button was pressed, the level's difficulty skyrocketed, making the already difficult task of reaching prompted pieces even harder. As a result, pressing the black button was perceived as a death knell, urging players to restart the level right after the black button was pressed. And after a few rounds of these, collective despair soon grew because of the overwhelming difficulty. The solution was to invert the black button's function. Instead of decaying the adjacent pieces, it would respawn them. This time around, the special black button was not avoided in fear, but in greed. It was a precious resource, to be used as late as possible. Big Giant Head Garfunkel's platform did not work in a survival setting, but I wondered if it could work in a different setting. In order for it to work, the level's progress could only advance if the player touched their respective prompt, an objective-based sequence. The level also needed a long-term objective for these sequences to link up. Turns out, the game campaign was lacking a final boss, and this was a good opportunity to salvage Garfunkel's platform and its respective movement and prompt system to a new level, the final one, the final boss. The defined long-term objective was to deplete the boss's life, but the players needed a way to interact with it. The first idea was to drain the boss's life every time a prompted platform piece was hit, but that presented two problems. Interaction was too indirect, and there was no opposite force that gave the boss a chance to defend itself. Enemies could be used to fulfill this purpose, but that dynamic was a bit too inspit. The final boss was expected to be more challenging than all the other levels, and was expected to require the player to use most, if not all, of their previously acquired skills. Inspired by classic game bosses, which stack different boss stages, the solution was to materialize the boss into an anthropomorphic head, and have the head appear in the center, equipped with the turret. The head shrank every time a sequence of platform pieces were hit, the players could directly interact with the center head by eating it, draining the boss's life. And difficulty progression was accomplished by decaying a set of platform pieces every time the small center head was defeated. Unfair. Fair.
giant washing machine drum was the initial concept of this level. Challenge was to transform this germinal idea into a fun level, coherent with the game's survival motto. Some scattered ideas were drafted into paper, such as having interactable controls to make the drum rotate in a given direction or stop the rotation entirely, but none of them were successfully transformed into a viable challenge as part of a larger challenge. The most interesting avenue was to reuse the piece decay concept from Beatmill. In Unfair Fair, the decay was caused by a specific enemy, which, if not hit by the respective player, it would explode and decay the nearby platform pieces. Once these pieces were touched, they would fall. Also, all the pieces near the platform spokes would be decayed at level start, to increase the chances of a partial to complete sub-platform detachment. The first iteration of this enemy that I've just mentioned would explode after bouncing a given amount of times, which proved to be unfair when the enemy bounces close to the ground, and this would give very little opportunity for the players to react. An iteration was made for this enemy to explode only after some time elapsed after its first bounce, which gave a fair chance for its dismantling. Later on, the visual presentation was reviewed to better represent how close the enemy was to explode, and the time taken to explode would decrease as the level progressed. Also, notice the waterfall backdrop below, that was reused from one of Garfunkel's experiments. Venom Rig Upon Garfunkel's closure, I began the development of a concept revolving around an oil rig-shaped platform. The platform would have four pillars that could be destroyed when the respective button was pressed. It would be against the player's interest to press these buttons, but this could be pressed by stomper enemies developed previously for rocket attacks. Apart from reusing enemies from previous levels, a new enemy was added, decay rockets. Upon landing, these enemies decayed the platform piece in which they landed, until the piece was completely detached from the platform. To stop them, the player could either destabilize their flight or break them in half. This decay rocket enemy was actually a rehash from an enemy from the prototype, which was called at the time Whiskey Tooth Decay. X Elevator The initial concept on paper was a 2.5D level in which a liquid would progressively rise as the players made their way up through a series of platforms. The rising liquid concept seemed promising, but having a series of fixed 2.5D platforms seemed somewhat bland and left little space for cooperation dynamics. The solution was to have an infinite amount of procedurally generated platforms, each higher than the previous one. And the only way to reach the next platform was through an elevator assigned to a specific player that had to be activated by touching all of the respective prompts. The elevators would only rise when all players occupied their respective elevator. Red Blob Games guides on hex grids were immensely useful when building procedurally generated honeycomb platforms. These guides clearly explained the theory behind hex grids with concise practical implementations. I highly recommend them to anyone working with hex grids. Upon the first playtest session with friends, it became apparent that small tweaks were required to the elevator's behavior. Because elevators would only rise when all players were sitting on top of their respective elevator, a problem arised if, near the upper platform, someone abandoned the elevator earlier than others. At some point, all elevators would drop, taking most of the players with them. The solution was to make each elevator independent shortly before they reached the upper platform, allowing for a smoother team transition between platforms. Tutorial It is often clearer to write the introduction of a book, essay or paper after they are finished, since at that point one has a better idea of what the final product looks like and knows which aspects need to be mentioned up front for everything to hold together. The tutorial level was left for last for these same reasons. It was the game's first level, but built last. It had the responsibility to introduce the game and to provide the essential tools and knowledge on how to play it, specifically on how to jump, double jump, dash and stomp. The overall concept of the level was inspired by an early version of Gang Beast's tutorial, which introduced the main movements in a fun environment. Having the controls presented out in billboards instead of using UI overlays seemed also appropriate and involving.
the first iteration had some of the pedagogic elements, but it was static and it was quite insipid. The following idea was to have a series of small platforms sitting by a pond. The instability of these floating platforms imprinted a livelier dynamic and were more physically sound than the initial tutorial iteration. After a playtest with friends, it was noticeable that few people understood how to dash and how important the combination of jump, dash and stomps were to gain air control. The solution was to add an animated billboard illustrating how the dash charge worked and add two additional sections focused on air control. The following playtests showed that these changes made a significant improvement on the player's comprehension of the game's basilar movements and techniques. Extra Block Towers This level was not used since no plausible game dynamics were found to fit the overall concept of the game, but the sheer fun and simplicity it provided while moving around high stacks of blocks are well worth the special mention. Menus and User Interface most of the menus and user interfaces were built in the late stages of development. Following the visual aesthetics that were mentioned earlier, the first rough screens were sketched out, and some experiments were made with the game's logo and UI elements, such as starting to use the colors and shapes of the hexagonal wave counter, which was a core element of the game. At about the same time, the title screen was built, Presented when opening the game and right before the home screen, it was crafted to create an impactful first impression and to showcase the most important elements of the game. The logo, the players, the enemies and some levels. Another important aspect was to illustrate that this was a co-op game, so the four players were placed in the forefront, aligned in such a way that no one was widely in front of anyone, with an about equal highlight to each of them. The inspiration for this screen came from games such as Super Mario Land 2, which presented all the key elements in one powerful stylized image. The home screen was the first one to be built and the remaining screens were progressively built and polished. And these were the screens for the video options, audio options, controls options, player selection, pause screen and game screen game selection and statistics audio music and sound effects were built using GarageBand and many freely available sound libraries were used to mash up different samples into new sound effects audio aimed to be clean and coherent so a small subset of samples were used and reused whenever possible these were tried to converge towards a mostly electronic music style. Music Keys Music key of a piece is a group of pitches or scale that form the basis of a musical composition, and the aim was to use a small subset of musical keys throughout the game. Survival Ball only used the C major key and its relative minor, A minor. Major keys are generally recognized as happier and joyful and minor keys as darker and heavier. Each of the game's audio pieces used one of these music keys to model the desired environment and feel. One interesting nugget of knowledge that I came to learn while developing the audio was that sound effects also fit within a certain key and the overall audio will sound much better when the sound effects and music are built with key accordance. Equalization Another interesting tidbit was to remove the extremely low and high frequencies in the final mix. The effect is threefold. Audio fatigue is reduced when editing makes the overall composition seem cleaner to the listener and leaves more headroom in the audible frequency range, improving the composition's focus and clarity. Organization The game ended up having more than 60 sound effects and around 20 musical segments. To keep this under control, a simple spreadsheet was used to track the name, category and the state. For example, was it done, needs revision or missing? This simple sheet improved the audio creation process considerably. Playtests, AI agents. <laughs>
Having the need to perform many iterations and tweaks without constant access to other testers, a simple AI was built to simulate multiplayer dynamics so that I could have a better grasp of how a level would feel. AI agents were specific to each level and driven by a series of objectives. For example, in Bitmill, the agent's main objective was to reach its respective colored prompt. If no prompt existed, it would move towards the platform center, the optimal place to wait for a prompt. It also had passive behaviors, such as avoidance of obstacles and gaps. The agents were not perfect, but they set up a good baseline. And the AI was only used during development, and it's not available in the public version of the game. Play tests, user tests. Once roughly tweaked, the game was presented to a group of friends during a playtest session. These sessions provided valuable feedback, criticisms, and validations of the various game elements. There were six playtest sessions in total, and apart from how valuable they were to improve the game, they were also a great opportunity to gather a group of friends and have a good time. And the game was modified and tweaked between each session after digesting the impressions and feedback from the previous one. The game versions used in these sessions had some backdoor hooks which allowed for quick macro difficulty tweaks during the session, such as for example how many waves were necessary to unlock a level. These were especially useful in the first playtest session, since the game was extremely punishing in its early incarnations. And for these sessions, these were some of the guidelines I tried to follow. First, I refrained from playing. This was so that I could not bias the other players with my actions, or spoil their discovery of the game. I only joined if the backdoor hooks were not enough to lower the difficulty to a point that was enjoyable by all the players. And if most of the feedback had already been provided, I sometimes joined near the session's end. Second, I sat behind the players, writing impressions and feedback. Sporadically, I asked for more details on a comment or behavior that they expressed. Being an observer, it was also easier to probe for mood fluctuations in the room. For example, when frustration started to build up due to the extreme difficulty of a level, it was easily noticeable when observing from the outside. The same applies for bursts of joy that a level or dynamic might cause. Third, gut reactions were very precious, so I would probe for more details on these reactions and I would encourage honest reactions and feedback. Number four, after the game was finished, I asked the players about their impressions, what they liked, what they didn't like, the level that they enjoyed the most and the level that they enjoyed the least. On that note, Rocket X, X Elevator and Big Giant Head were among the top favorites and Venomrig and Fairfair and Beatmill were most often referred as the less enjoyable of the bunch. And finally, to further diminish my bias on the feedback, I only explained the reasons behind the given design decision after the game was finished and most of the feedback had been given. Launch. The game was launched on November 8th, 2018. One month earlier, the Steam Store page official website and Twitter account were brought online. During that month, a closed beta ran on Steam, which mostly served for last mile validations, since the bulk of the iterations were made during the in-person playtesting phases. At the same time, several dozens of keys were sent to YouTubers, with notable regard to the ones specialized in couch co-op games. To the ones contacted by email, I took into attention the video by Stephen, where he describes the kind of emails that he expects to receive from developers. You can find the video link in the description below. Afterwards, I was advised by fellow developers that the overall strategy was not optimal, because it is usually a good idea to build your following by sharing your progress and interacting with the community during development, through social networks or dev blogs, for example. And this is to potentially increase the game's exposure and sales. In the future, if I happen to develop a new game, I'll probably give this strategy a try and take note of how the workflow and the game design would be influenced. IndieX Shortly after completing the first beta build of the game, I submitted my application to IndieX, the biggest indie game showcase and contest in Portugal at the time. Fortunately, Survival Ball was accepted as one of the 55 finalists, 
meaning that it would be showcased in Portugal's Lisbon Games Week 2018, a week after the game's launch. A custom build was specially crafted for the event to better fit the event's environment, and the build offered an arcade experience through local leadboards for the players with the highest number of completed waves, and leaderboards for the fastest players to finish Big Giant Head and the tutorial. A simple control sheet sheet was added to the pause menu and the end game screens were changed to allow the players to enter their group name into the leaderboard. All levels were unlocked in this build, avoiding the need to finish the campaign to access a specific level. The event surpassed all of my expectations. It was the first time that I saw, in person, several anonymous groups of people playing survival ball. It was pleasantly surprising to see many groups of gamers trying out the game, playing it for hours, and then even returning back to the booth at a later time to play a bit more. One interaction that was especially rewarding was when a group was playing the game all the way until its end, and I've been there just observing. Towards the end, one of them turns to me and says, this game is awesome. To which I reply, thank you. And he asks why. I then say that I made the game. So they had no idea that I was the creator, let alone the only developer, and they unanimously praised the experience. It was rewarding to witness such moments. The showcase was also a great opportunity to connect with other developers and get to know their stories and games. The overall experience was incredible and I'm immensely thankful for the organizers for putting all of it together. These were the tools used throughout the entire project. First one is Unity, the game engine in which the game was built. Rewired, which is a Unity plugin and a godsend for managing input. Rider, a .NET IDE used to develop and manage the game's code. Blender was used to build all of the 3D models and map their respective textures. Blender is one of the most powerful free and open source software tools that I've ever used and puts up a good fight against proprietary packages such as 3ds Max. All textures were crafted in Inkscape. Almost all textures were vector based and later rasterized for Unity in PNG format. GarageBand for music and sound effects composition, Time for project time tracking, Git for source control, and GitLab to host the private repos for the game's project and website. Time log. As I mentioned before, time tracking was important for personal accountability, and these were the final stats. It took me 1,334 hours to complete the first alpha build, then an extra 308 hours until the release on Steam. In total, from the very beginning until the finish of support and maintenance provided after the launch of the game, the entire endeavor took 1,716 hours. If you're curious, I've posted an article with more details about what we discussed in this video, and there you can find a breakdown by categories, such as coding, visual work, tooling, research and study, audio, marketing, tests, user support, bureaucracies, etc. Final notes. I had an amazing experience building and launching this game, and I'm sincerely happy with the final results. Not only did it materialize one of my long-standing dreams, but gave me the opportunity to explore and deepen areas outside my professional expertise, such as 3D modeling, texturing, audio, and game design. If you're a game developer or you're thinking of becoming one, I hope this testimony was useful for your journey and I hope it brings more clarity into the overall process. And with this, I'll see you on the next one.